The numbers seem obvious, but when you look at them, you go, huh? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Mike Stenhouse is the executive director of the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity, and they've issued a report which is substantial and data filled, and will probably have you look at it and say, wow, that's a lot of money. But I'm not sure what we can do about it, and I'm not sure what your will is to even think about doing something about it. And so we'll talk about that with Mike tonight. Uh, I know that's a weird start to the show, but I think you'll understand as we go. It is a pleasure to have you aboard. Thank you very much for checking in with us. What a morning it was in Washington. Holy moly. Uh, the headline starts with a bar no-show, right? You know, I'm big on the empty chair when candidates don't come for debates. It seems the Democrats like that technique when they're trying to get answers from the attorney general. Certain financial documents. The House Judiciary Committee held a hearing, but the witness didn't show. Ordinarily at this point, I would introduce the witness. But instead, but instead... We will conclude this proceedings. Attorney General William Barr was scheduled to testify about his handling of special counsel Robert Mueller's report this morning, but he backed out when Democrats added an extra hour of questioning by staff attorneys. If he and his committee aren't capable of actually asking the attorney general questions themselves and need to staff that out, it seems like a pretty pathetic uh, moment for the chairman of that committee. Republicans point to the five hours of testimony in the Senate Wednesday as proof the attorney general is willing to answer Congress's questions. Instead, we go back to a circus political stunt to say we want it to look like an impeachment hearing because they won't bring impeachment proceedings. The Justice Department called the committee's request for staff lawyers inappropriate and unnecessary, and so far it has also not complied with a subpoena to turn over the full unredacted Mueller report. Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler says he is willing to hold the Attorney General in contempt of Congress. If he does not provide this committee with the information it demands and the respect it deserves, Mr. Barr's moment of accountability will come soon enough. That will set up a battle that will likely be settled in the courts. This, this is incredible. Look, here's the thing. The Constitution allows for co-equal branches of government. How the Democrats comport themselves in a hearing is the Democrats' business. If they want lawyers to ask questions for continuity and to put a little pressure on Barr, then they have every right in the world to do that. And the Republicans know that. It's a rarely used technique, but, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's something in history that's been done on a handful of occasions. Having said that, uh, the Republicans and, and, and the White House are playing the Democrats because the more they don't cooperate, the more the Democrats get nutty about this, the more the boomerang effect begins to come into place, a la Bill Clinton. Remember, he was impeached, not convicted, and he won re-election. They are banking, and no doubt that E.G. Barr is part of the White House think team on this. And he's also trying to create a legacy for himself, by the way, because he's such a firm believer in executive power, no matter who's in the White House, that he's going to stand on a lot of this executive power flavor. And his arrogance, I think, has uh, telegraphed that that's all his thing. The Democrats, though, are, are making a big, big mistake on, on one level, that they wanted to hold a hearing here and they're going to hold him in contempt and they're going to go to the Supreme Court to get a force on A.G. Barr to testify. Okay, they have a right to do that. The White House and the Attorney General should be respecting because it doesn't matter how they comport themselves, they have the authority to do what they want to do. But they shouldn't be doing this. Look at this. Uh, look at this. Here's, well, you know, this, is, this, this was the end of the hearing, and it got Mike down, and there was a good fight going on. But then there's this nonsense. The, so the Democrats think it's kind of interesting, and Representative Cohen from Tennessee decides to bring the Kentucky Fried Chicken, 
And now he's going to put the chicken thing near near Barr's seat. Are, 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 are they just are they are they born stupid? Chicken bar in the Democratic up Party today and answered questions. Yeah, right. Uh, okay, en uh, enough of that. I mean, are, are, they must just be. They, they must have like a stupid gene. Wh why w could you just depersonalize this? Stop attacking the president personally. Stop using stunts and gimmicks like that. It takes away from the process arguments that you rightly can make. Gosh, I mean, it's like a bunch of four-year-olds down there, and that's why America is turned off, absolutely turned off. Let's come home and, and talk about the labor bills that are, that are moving through. As we speak, we probably, certainly by midnight, uh, if you're watching the 730 show, this has probably already been voted on. The Senate um, uh, uh, is pa actually, it's already passed. Well, I missed it. I just, sorry. Time frames. The Senate has already passed the labor bills uh, that have been in front of them, including the Evergreen Bill. Uh, this is what's been called the Evergreen Bill. It's a continuing contract bill, meaning when a contract expires, it continues on terms until such time as another agreement comes. Uh, Bob Walsh from the NEA was here recently to explain why they so vigorously fought for this. What we'd want to do in negotiations is get a deal, and deal usually involves raises or other concessions if there's literally no money on the table. The simple way for management to push the issue in the horrible budget situation you just outlined. But remember, communities have to budget exactly the school budget they had the prior year plus a dollar. The poison pill that management already has is say, we're cutting program, we're cutting staff, we're cutting this, and that's how we're going to save the money unless you come to the table and deal with us. So you think that's the answer? No, I think that's, the, that's how you get the pressure to get a deal. Mm. Meaning, just threaten to lay people off. And I remind you that Mayor Lombardi was here this week, and he was suggesting that the union rank and file ought to be thinking about something else. And what Bob is saying is, hey, you know what? Lay them off. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that the solution that, that you want to have in your toolbox? I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I haven't talked to one uh, administrative manager or mayor that would have liked to or would enjoy laying anyone off. We don't want to lay anyone off. But I will tell you this, Dan, that if I was a member of that union, I wouldn't be paying him dues. Why would you pay him dues? He's suggesting the answer is lay some of his brothers and sisters off. The problem that I see here is that we care more about his brothers and sisters than he does. And that's where I think the, the disingenuous part or genuous part of this whole thing comes in, and that is that this legislation puts the administrators and, and mayors on their heels in a way that forces them to take out the nuclear option. And that's never good politics unless it absolutely has to be done, and most times it doesn't absolutely have to be done, right? Uh, Mike Stenhouse uh, has his report that we want to talk about, but I know you've got thoughts on this because it's actually even mentioned, I believe, in your report, right? Yeah, our report mostly focuses on the financial cost of collective bargaining with government unions, but, but this bill, you talk about being turned off, this bill turns off Rhode Islanders. When, when we're, we're one of the weakest recovering states in the nation in jobs and population after the recession, and, and this report shows how government services are being overpaid for by a massive amount, $888 million a year, and then they do something extra and give them more advantage, that's when the people of Rhode Island lose trust in their government. And w when you talk to people who are leaving our state by the droves, and you and I know they're leaving, they cite the cost and they cite the fact that nothing's going to change yeah, in this uh, state, well, and this perpetuates that. This leaving by the droves thing, is it fantasy or reality? I mean, I know that no, we're, we're a million fifty thousand people. We're you know, we've been as high as a million one. I mean, I don't know where the droves are. Well, droves relative to other states, yeah. We're, we're losing. Other states are growing, and we're going to lose a U.S. congressional seat. But the Northeast is losing population in general. Rhode Island is among the worst at the very bottom, except for maybe California and Illinois. But so, the, the so congressional seat thing is interesting because while others are populating, right. we are losing population. I mean, Mass has gone through it. I mean, there's this notion... I mean, we're right on that cusp of legitimizing two congressional districts. I, I don't know that that ought to be the bellwether for our health. Well, more, well, we're losing our tax base, which is a combination of population and income. We do know, and it's fact, I don't have it in front of me, the people leaving 
are at a higher income level than the people coming in, and yet we keep spending more and more, and we keep giving more of taxpayer dollars away to the special interest groups. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, the, you got to you got to admit, if you're watching this, I know you do closely. The mayoral former government has taken its lumps this se yeah. this season, right? Yeah. Uh, and they are the most accountable to the people right. in, in in the community. They are the ones. They, the councils, the school committees, are the ones that have to face people in the supermarkets to say, yeah, I know. The best, the best governments are the ones closest to the people, and, and I hate to say it, but this is evidence of how this rigged system works. As soon as local employers find a cost-saving measure, the union bosses go running up to their friends in the state house and pass a bill that said, no, 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 you can't do that. All right, we'll talk more about this rigged system, but more importantly, Mike's got really interesting data here that um, some of you are going to say, wow, and others are going to go start throwing tomatoes at the screen, so stay with us. By the way, my confusion on when the Senate passed this Evergreen bill is they had originally scheduled it for Thursday, uh, but I think they hustled it up. And there's a lot of stuff going on right now at the, at the State House. And sometimes they get this, the, the, the tough stuff, meaning the stuff that puts it to the taxpayer early. Because then you forget about it when they're racing uh, at midnight in June. And then they hit you again. <laughs> Here's the headline on our discussion tonight. Uh, Pro Joe uh, took a good look at, uh, at, at Mike, obviously, and the, the cost of the taxpayers uh, on, on these kinds of things, public employee unions. Here's the front page of the report that Mike wants a lot of people to pay attention to. You can link through our website at foxprovince.com to RA Future. Uh, I'm sorry, I do that all the time, rifreedom.org. <laughs> it's actually, the RA Future is the is like the, anti <laughs> uh, the antithesis. Uh, so they're good people, but they don't think the same way. I can promise you that. No. Uh, you want people to take a look at this report. I, I, I empathize with a lot of your concepts here. I've been talking about this stuff for years. I do have so, uh, some critical questions in terms of, of, of the, some of the assertions, but why don't you lay out for us why you wrote this report and what do you think is the most significant thing about it? So we, we are concerned, as we talked about in the prior segment, about people leaving our state and the lack of job growth, the lack of income growth, and we wanted to understand why. So we heard so much about property taxes, people always telling me. So I said, let's, let's look at that and see what is driving property taxes and is it the collective bargaining? process because property tax is basically pay to support government at the local level, right? So we, we hired a Penn State professor, a finance professor, PhD, who did a regression analysis, crunched all kinds of... A regression analysis is what? It's a, it's a, it's a statistical method where you, you take uh, all kinds of data and you control for a couple of variables. If this changes, how much does it change that? If we change this one variable, how much does it change the outcome? So you can control for certain things such as education, ex uh, experience, you know, years on the job kind of thing. So you can come out with an apples to apples kind of comparison. So we compared private sector workforce in Rhode Island with government workforce in Rhode Island. And the findings were, now it gives you a range, but our best estimate was that Rhode Islanders are paying 27% more than they need to compared to their private sector equivalent for government services, for the compensation of government workers. And that means $888 million a year in total, state and local, and it also means about a 25% higher property tax than you otherwise would be paying if we were just paying government workers at the same, and treating them the same way we treat the rest of us. Private in sector the, In workers. the private sector, right. So here, here's, the, here's the concept that I think some people are having, and even I'm trying to have, I, I'm trying to get my mind around this. I don't know what the apples to apples comparison is here because you have fire, teachers, police, say, is the big three, so to speak, unions and public employee, and there are others, obviously. There's no comparable profession, right? I mean, IT people and administrative assistants and uh, maintenance workers and mechanics and those kinds of folks and chefs and uh, who Janitorial, work in public employee administration, right, right, all construction. That, that's comparable. Yeah. Yeah. But the big three aren't really comparable. So how do you regression or not? How do you how do you make a comparison? Because it seems to me that you want to strike an awareness out there 
according to your thought, that we are paying more money than we should for government services, correct? Yes. But but you say, hey, if, because there is no private sector cop. There is no private sector teacher. I mean, there's private schools, I get that. But in, by and large, I don't know how... I don't know how you make this thing jibe. Okay, well, we do it on a line-by-line -line basis, actually. So you'd have to talk to the professor about how which data he crunched and how it all came out. That's way above my pay grade. But if you go through our report and you look at, we can, you can compare. I know you've got a bunch of screens. Right? We can put them up early rather than late if you yeah. want to pull on uh, some. Actually, I don't think they're on those screens. But, okay. but when you look at all these extra things, we know, we know that there's generous pensions and we know there's generous health care and we know... You get paid for time off. You get paid for all kinds of ways you don't work, clothing allowances, sabbaticals, continuing education, getting paid for work, work you would do while you're already on the job. You get paid extra. There's so many ways that collective bargaining is driving up compensation in ways that don't exist in the private sector at all, no matter what two job functions you want to compare. You, you can begin to see how, how well, it adds up Well, you've got some charts. You're like, yeah. for instance, sure. six, six days, the sick days. Put the yep. sick, uh, yep. Jess, if you would put sick days up, the full screen on sick days. Uh, again, you have to have a big screen so for the, this. So the dark blue is private sector, the light blue is public. The amount of sick days based on your years of experience. Obviously, they go up a little bit with more years on the job, but you can see that public sector sick days are generally 30 to 40 percent higher. Not only do they get more sick days, but unlike private sector, they can cash them in if they don't use them. Private sector can only roll over a very small percentage of their sick days. Public sector, you can roll them all over and, and, and in many cases, get paid for that. And the public sector would say, yeah, but we don't, in Rhode Island, we don't have TDI, meaning short-term disability insurance, and we don't have Social Security. Uh, some of these unions, most of these major unions do not. And so they say, well, we bank our sick days, because we don't have TDI. Well, that's why we looked at total comp. So one way or another, there's a total compensation package from the private sector, and there's a total compensation package. Yes, they compose different things, right? But, but that's why we looked at total comp. And you look at total compensation, all those factors, 27% higher. And I think we have that graph. Um, Which one the, is this? The last one, I think. Sure. Yeah, this uh, one right average here. Average total compensation. So right. you can see yes. the, the bottom line is pri private sector compensation, how it's risen over the last 20 years or so. And and the top one, or is it more than that? It's uh, Yeah, 20 years on the top line. And you can see that it's getting wider. You know, the difference is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, so the old adage is always was, you know, public employees make less yeah. salary and they make up for that in benefits. That was and that, job security. And job security. That was always the, 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 the speak. Has that notion changed? Yeah, in Rhode Island they also have higher base salary. So, so, the, so, so we're even beginning above the norm in Rhode Island. Our 2012 study showed that Rhode Island was the only state where public sector salaries were higher than in the private sector as well. So we're even beginning at a disadvantage for taxpayers. All right, so when we come back, we'll talk about where the comparisons really ought to be. Public sector to private sector employees inside Rhode Island or public sector Rhode Island employees to other states' public sector employees. Hike, be Got right it. back. <laughs> Again, this is the report. You can go to rifreedom.org and, and, and download it. Print it if you'd like. Uh, you can also we'll link at foxprovince.com as well uh, to the report. The, it's a pretty tough title. Public Union Excesses. Excesses. Yeah. Excesses. Say that three times fast. <laughs> Excesses. Uh, I'll try it off air. But that's the theme. That's your theme. Well, that's the fact. We didn't come up with that title until after we saw the numbers. Are the public sector Rhode Island excesses any more excessive than the Massachusetts or the Connecticut? excesses? I don't know. That wasn't the subject of this report. That's a good question. But wouldn't that be the natural thing? Because no. if, if public employee status is a more expensive in nature by culture and contract, look, I'm not disputing, I understand. and this is worth a read. I don't care if it's you think debate. Mike's full of it or not. <laughs> look, at this, look at the report and, and see the differences in benefits and, 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 and all sorts of things that have been negotiated into contracts when it comes to pension, when it comes to uh, uh, health care, when it comes to the miscellaneous stuff like six days and clothing allowances and all that kind of stuff, and make a judgment for yourself as to whether you think that's excessive. Um, 
it's it, it's good for people to at least be informed as to what the cost of doing business is. Happy to have a good debate. Let me tell you why we did it the way we did it. Because it's so we have basically ten percent of the Rhode Island workforce are unionized government workers. Okay, paid for a little bit by them and by the ninety percent of the rest of us in the private workforce. So we think the fair question to ask is: Is it proper? Is it a proper balance that the ten percent? should get treated so much more generously than the 90%, especially when the 90% are, and are paying for that 10%. So that's why we think it's here, because it, it's fair to look at it that way, because it's we, the taxpayers, that are paying for, uh, paying for that through property, massive property ta uh, taxes that are way too high and through about $300 million in extra state revenue. We, we could have paid for all the bridges and roads repairs just by, just by paying market rates to, to government workers at the state level. We could have paid for all the buildings and school repairs that we need in four years just by, just by paying government workers the same and treating them the same as we do us in the private sector. So we think that's the fair question to ask. Who has an appetite to tackle ah. this? Hmm. Not too many people we've seen. There's a myth out there that if you, in politics, that if you take on uh, union issues, it's, it's the it's suicide. But you look at Wisconsin, Governor Walker got reelected a number of times. You look at Michigan, they, after they went right to work and defeated the big Michigan proposal referendum out there, the, the, the Republicans took control of that right, state. And remind everybody what right to work is. Yeah. Right to work confuses people. Right to work simply gives workers the freedom to choose whether or not they want to be in the union, be in a, pay union dues or not. That's right. all. And, That's all and we've had some Supreme Court yep. decisions on this, and yep. uh, there's been a lot of reaction by the unions trying to fight back in all sorts of ways. Look at what North Kingstown has in its school committee problem right now with infiltration of NEA executives walking conflicts of interest, trying to keep the battle alive. Well, look, I think the report is fascinating. It's w Before you get all biased up about, hey, well, that's just the cost of doing business, you know, he's always picking on you, just read the report yeah. and be informed as to what the cost is. If this is acceptable to the that's people right. yep. and government, Nothing will happen. well, then you'll put this on the shelf. Nothing will happen. We're going to keep it alive. We've got some follow-up uh, issues to report on. Do you have a tangible end game? I have 30 seconds here. Do you have a tangible end game? Or if you could, if you, could uh, you know, get the genie bottle out or make a dream come true, what would you want to have as a response? I would, li I would like to have some lawmakers approach us based on public uh, I inquisitions or inquiries to say, hey, what can we do about this? In fact, I have a meeting Friday with a couple lawmakers. I don't think they want me to name them right now on this very regard. No, and they're probably Republicans. Uh, probably, but maybe not. No, uh, they are. They're Republicans. <laughs> but, but, this is not a Democrat that's going to look at this and say, okay, Mike, thanks so much for the ammo. <laughs> we'll just load our budgetary <laughs> rifle and get going here. That ain't happening. Not yet, anyway. But it's worth the report. R worth the read. RIfreedom.org. You'll see the report, and we'll link it on foxprovince.com. Mike, appreciate your work. So Thank you, Dan. All right. The final word when we come back. So tomorrow night, we have a very special program, the Honor Flight, which is uh, just, just the most wonderful thing going, a special Honor Flight exclusively for women who served our country. Uh, I think you're going to really love it. So make an appointment for it, okay? We'll see you on the radio at 3 on WPRO as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Good night.